I'm Alex. I will be your host for the entire week. But today, mainly warming everyone up for our main topic, an industrial platform economy to spur innovation. We started back in 2015 with Connect University, which is the knowledge sharing flagship initiative of DigiConnect and the Commission, which aims to update both the EU staff and you, the general public, about the latest digital trends, as well as important digital policies. The scope of our session in general is to put at the same table EU institutions, industry, academia, and international organizations, helping us find inspiration from each other, identify current opportunities and threats to digital policymaking. For those of you who are not yet connected via slide, that though, we invite you to please do so using the code platforms. I say this because over there you can ask questions and we will make sure they make their way towards the speakers. Also, we encourage everyone uh, to use the hashtag connect university and digital infrastructures when sharing any insights that you might get on social media. In terms of recording, they will be all available as of next week and you can check both the digital EU channel on YouTube and the connect university page on Futurium. We invite everyone on Futurium. It's the place where we have discussions on re relevant digital topics. We have sub areas for each, and it's the place where we also get inspiration for uh, future uh, topics, if I can say it like that. Um, so we must run alongside with it, making sure we have access to the most up-to-date information to reach our destination in good shape. So, in terms of future destinations of our school, we still have tomorrow, in the last day, the session on mobile generations from 1G to 5G and beyond. And lastly, we will end the week with the closing session, EU digital infrastructure in a global ecosystem. The aim of that is to give more of a holistic view of the entire week to get uh, the best insights from each of the smaller session and also give the commission's plans and concerns for the future in terms of greening digital infrastructures. As for our session of today on industrial platforms, you know, to give a more comprehensive context as well as shed some light on the topic for uh, non-experts such as I, as well as for those of you which are more fluent on the matter, we have with us today Max Lemke, Head of Unit Internet of Things, Johanna Sanidaki, Chief Innovation Officer at Ertico, Antoine Mathieu, Manager Energy Services Platform Elia, and last but not least, Francesca Flamini, Innovation and Funding Manager at TTP. So without further ado, please, Max, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for introducing me. I can still not see me. me. Can you see me? I'm not sure whether the, the colleagues are seeing me. I think they still see you. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, welcome. Welcome to this Connect University session, and in particular, a very warm welcome to, to the colleagues from ex the external colleagues who are here to give you some of the examples from, from, from the different sectors. And I think that's extremely Im important. So I will just try to give a bit of an introduction. As uh, Alex has said, I'm the head of unit for Internet of Things, but I'm also responsible for three areas in Connect, and that is mobility, agriculture, and energy. And so you will have a very application oriented session here today on uh, the on, on the issue of platforms. My, maybe to myself, I had the privilege to spend six months in 2020 as a fellow and guest professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And Seattle, in a way, for me, is the capital of the cloud, but it's also one of the or the home of a lot of 
industry actors who play a key role in platforms. And, and actually that has inspired me to become a strong promoter of platforms in our economy to strengthen European industry. So this session is largely on the innovation aspect of digital platforms as I see it. Um, but we will also look a little bit at the regulatory side, but just just a little bit. We will we will have examples from automotive, mobility, energy, agriculture, and another topic important is manufacturing, but we couldn't fit all this into one session. So that's basically next. what what I how I see this session, an innovation session. I'll motivate you a bit and give a legislative framework with the hooks to the to the things we have on the table right now, and I'll give you some examples. So to start, energy is a very hot issue. So energy, you know, at the moment, the big crisis, the energy emergency. So you see, be, besides the crisis, you see that that the energy demand is is growing when you look at what what we have today you see the current home solar installations at the moment 7 million 10% of european homes they will go up to 40 million and 50% of european homes by 2050 is expected and we need an extra grid capacity of a factor of 4 here to be able to cope with that EV, electric vehicle charging, is another one. We have, by 2030, we expect, expect 60 million more electric vehicles. That's an enormous demand on energy. And EV charging at home will be done for 88% of them. So 29 million home chargers in Europe by 2030. So that's an enormous increase. We see extra energy flowing through European homes worth 29 billion euros, just to give you some numbers. And we expect that there can be energy bill savings per family of more than 3,000 euro a year if it's done in a smart way. The energy market of producers, distributors, and consumers is extremely complex. A lot of different market actors coming together in particular, when even linking to other sectors like the mobility, e mobility, the mobility sector to the building sector or to other market sectors. Now, let me come to a first poll and ask you some questions on, on, on Slido. So, do you have solar panels? Do you have an electric vehicle? Do you optimize your room temperature at home? And do you use apps? I mean, different apps, thermostats, heat pump, solar, inverter, EV charging, smart meter, some others. So if you can go through that and uh, maybe answer that question. And while you do that, I will draw one conclusion that, that, that I, have, I can draw from the discussions we had with consumers. The consumer doesn't want five, six, seven, eight different apps to control these kind of features in, in electricity. And also they have to work together. So the consumer needs a platform which integrates the different applications across many market actors in an open dynamic marketplace. So that's what the user wants. He wants to control it all together and he wants also to, to make sure that he can explore, explore the dependencies between them, when the sun is shining, turn on the dishwasher, for example, or when the car is loading, maybe then not do the, uh, use the dishwasher, and also depending on the price of the energy. So that's the first motivation for platforms. You see, energy is connected to electromobility and smart buildings. There's a need for cross-sector platforms. And what, what do we want at the end? We want to deliver a fair and green deal for consumers. So here comes the green in. There's a strong market push through e-mobility, but also now through the energy crisis, the efficient integration of renewables is extremely important. So we see integrated smart home building services, which are connected to the Internet of Things. So one of the digital enablers of, of all of this. And we also see EV batteries, electric vehicle batteries, becoming a reservoir of energy when 
energy is expensive or when we do not have enough energy. You may have heard this week the announcement by Elia and Elia, a Belgian provider, and Volkswagen to collaborate on bidirectional charging. That basically means it is it is using the energy or that is available in the battery in the car in order to what 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 the, the experts in energy call shaving peaks. So when we have peak demands in your household, for example, in the evening when you watch TV, when your dishwasher is running, when lights are on, and uh, then we need a lot of energy. And for this period, you could use your car, the, the, the energy in your car, and then load your car, charge your car a bit later at night when everybody's sleeping and no energy is needed. So we can, sh we can shave the peak and maybe need, do not need the coal power plants as much as we would need them if we do everything at the same time. There's a lot of investment necessary on infrastructure there, substitution of the fossil fuels by electricity. You need what we call smart grids or what nowadays are called agile or reactive grids to be efficient operation. Yeah, so you, you, you want to operate as efficient and agile as you can with your electricity. You need to integrate the electric vehicle charging into the grid. And as a customer, you have to also become agile to reduce your energy consumption. And last but not least, what always counts for every consumer, save money. That's what is behind it, all, of, all of that. So when you look at this triangle of this sector coupling of the renewable energy, the bidirectional EV charging and the smart home, that's the problem space that we are looking at, you can easily expand that, but I think this is the problem space we all easily understand. And the technologies behind is first the connectivity to the Internet of Things, then it's the, then it's the data spaces, how do we share data, and it's all the infrastructure that is available in the home and for charging. So the integration of apps and infrastructure along digital platforms on an open marketplace is needed to bring the benefits to the consumer. So again, here, we need platforms to bring it to can the we, consumer. Can we have the result of the poll now? Yeah, maybe maybe before I go to the next one, you can tell us the results of, do you have the results of the poll? Yes. So tell us. have the most people, it's 63% have access to a home thermostat to manage their heating. Next, people that have apps to access the energy generated by solar panels. On the same place, people that have access to home security systems. And on the last place, those that access their car or their electric vehicles. So heating and thermostats on the first place. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So now let's come to some concepts of the digital industrial platforms. Platforms you all know well from the consumer side, the Amazon platform, the Uber platform, or the platforms on your mobile phone, the iOS if you have an Apple phone, an iPhone, or Android if you have, a, uh, you have an Android-based phone. So you also see platforms of platforms emerging. So like, for example, Check24 on car on, on rental cars, for example, they go across different platforms and find you the cheapest one. Or Skyscanner to find flights, you find the cheapest provider with that. So platform of platform concepts. But what is the real value of a platform? The real value of a platform is the size of the ecosystem. And there is a good example, Amazon as, as a retailer is probably one of the most successful ones because they share this huge ecosystem of vendors and users, not only selling themselves, but also being a broker for selling. And that's also where some of the problems coming, which I come to later. So there are different levels of openness. Interfaces are open. That's usually the case for Android or iOS. You have application programming interfaces that is open. Some platforms are open source. Some have marketplaces that are controlled. They are, for example, controlled by hyperscalers or gatekeepers. Gatekeeper, just to, to explain the term, a gatekeeper is someone who has the power to decide who gets particular resources or opportunities <coughs> and who does not. 
Like, for example, if a retailer wants to favor his own products, he could do that because he owns the platform, he's the gatekeeper, even he may have open APIs, he still gives preference to his own products. Could happen. Just as an example of what a gatekeeper could be. So some of these marketplaces are controlled and gives them a chance to gain a dominant role or block access to others. When you look at the political case of, of uh, China and the US and uh, Android, yeah, Google and Huawei, you, 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 may, you may know that Google closed access to Android for Huawei, and that's why Huawei now needs their own platform and ecosystem, which they call Harmony, because it's not as open as it should be any, any, anymore. Now, when you look at these platforms and we now go to industry, you see now that industry often benefits from very open multi-vendor platforms, which create a fair and equal level playing field. And an example is Autozar. Autozar is a, is a standard or a platform where all manufacturers of cars around the world work together at the tier ones, the suppliers work together on standards on how data is exchanged in the car, for example, how you deal with mixed criticalities. That means when the braking system needs resources, you give it to the braking system rather than using it for entertainment because you don't want the excuse that you had an accident and the bus was busy because it was downloading some, something from the entertainment sector. So that is the role that, that, that was agreed with in this Autozar platform and allows now many OEMs to, to use the same supplier and suppliers using the selling to many OEMs. So it's a very open place. When you look at others like, like the, 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 the ecosystem of Tesla, Tesla is creating a well-controlled marketplace for the electric vehicle and all kinds of services around. But it's not as open. It's very well controlled, charging infrastructures, home battery and solar. So that is just to give you some examples. And when you see the, the importance of industrial platforms, you see, for example, when you look at Android wanting being an entertainment kind of platform, but moving into the platforms of the car, the industrial platform of the car through Android Auto, or Apple is doing, is doing the same with, with, with CarPlay. So, so they are expanding their space, and we have to make sure that in future, we make sure that we have open platforms and that we do not get gatekeepers who control in a way that we, we don't want the market to be, to be controlled. So we want to have it fair and open. Next slide is just giving you an example of interoperability, which is key for platforms. They are the glue between the players in the ecosystem. So it's, it's the platforms carry for standardization, for, for, for application programming interfaces, for aggregating information, for sharing data, for having developing a partnership model between all the actors around the marketplace including business models, by the way, and revenue models that belong to it. So there's the business side as well. And last not least, the app. And when you look at the energy case, we, we have these kind of emerging platforms give a lot of opportunities for new market entrants from all kinds of sectors, just such as the one who operate the charging points or retail companies like Ikea or Amazon who, who do that and do, who do more like mobility services providers like Uber or BlaBlaCar, housing companies, railway. So it's a whole ecosystem that is, uh, that, that is coming up. Now, having talked a lot now about motivation, let's get a couple of things on the legislative framework. So, so the, 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 the Data Act is the basis and a lot of these regulations, legislations, are in the pipe or have already entered into force. There's first the, the Data Governance Act, which ensures that there is trust in data transactions. So there are certain rules for that. So that public sector data, private data, and personal data can be voluntarily made available by data holders without the data holders being afraid of putting their data. 
There's a Digital Market Act, which regulates the market power based on data. I come back to that in a second. The Data Act that ensures fairness in the allocation of data value, the value of data among the actors of the data economy. And I come back to that in a second as well. And there's also the Artificial Intelligence Act, which gar guarantees the safety and the fundamental rights of people and businesses when using artificial intelligence. And then also last but not least, the Digital Services Act that sets common rules on intermediaries with obligations and accountability. So that gives you an overview. And, and I think if you want to know more, you have to dig into more detail. I don't think we, we can do the data legislation in three minutes in such a presentation. So if I come to an example, the Digital Markets Act, that goes back to this example I have given about a retailer. It makes sure that there is a fair and contest, there are fair and contestable digital markets. So there, there are mechanisms to identify gatekeepers including emerging ones, and to take actions to put obligation at them. So, for example, a retailer doesn't favor his own product if he is at the same time also the marketplace, but gives fair access to all the ones who provide such products. And if this doesn't happen, there are comprehensive remedies foreseen, including for systematic non-compliance that we observe and EU enforcement. So you see this example of a couple of weeks ago on a 4.1 billion euro fine for Google, who imposed unlawful restrictions on manufacturers of Android mobile devices and mobile network operators in order to consolidate the dominant position of its search engine. So there was a huge fine. And with that, we are imposing that Google can no longer impose its will on the phone makers and now they may open their devices, have to open their devices to competition in search and other services. And that is important to allow consumers to benefit and have more offers on the market and choose the best and also the one that properly offers the best price. Now the data app is as well going in in, in is going in another direction. It's it's more or less on the right of data sharing so that third parties, for example, can use the data that they need to offer certain services. Very simple example is your garage for services of your car who wants access to the data in your vehicle. And the data act sets out the basic rules with which this is made possible and with which the OEM, the manufacturer of the car, cannot restrict that data bus, but must make certain data available as to get these uh, bigger sharing of data. And there we look in particular at tackling contractual unfairness, making business data available for, as a common good, or also switching between, between cloud service providers or avoiding vendor login. Now, when you look at that politically, and when you look at all these kind of actions coming together, we I just draw you a picture with the common open digital platforms and ecosystems in the center and all the kind of policies that are contributing to these platforms. That is the Ships Act, where the next generation of chips are designed and manufactured. Low energy semiconductors on the left hand side. On the right hand side, you see all the aspects of the data strategy. That means investment in data spaces, mobility, energy, agriculture, but also the data legislation that I talked about. The new industrial strategy, which, which calls for open, dynamic ecosystems for EU technology businesses. And last but not least, the next generation IoT platforms that allow new digital enablers like decentralized intelligence, cognitive computing to come in and to be used. And for that, you need platforms that support standardization, interoperability, sector integration vertically and horizontally, but also make sure we don't get into conflict with competition law. And uh, in particular, in the current geopolitical situation where this, this becomes more and more important. Now, just a couple of examples. Yeah, just a couple of examples in the agricultural space. 
the common European agricultural data space, which we are supporting through our digital pro program, the deployment of that data space, there are different beneficiaries. And I think that's a very usual, uh, usual fact in platforms. There are different types of beneficiaries. Sometimes people call it multi multi-sided marketplaces. So the benefit for the farmer is to improve performance with enhanced decision support. There's a private sector benefiting by making tools available and exploiting the data in their tools. And the public sector gets new data to do sector analysis, to, to, to analyze the certain green aspects of the agricultural sector, for example. And when you look at platforms that exist in the agricultural sector, there are many of them on different levels available. There's, for example, the farm, farm management systems by some of the uh, machinery providers that, that provide that, or by some of the pesticide uh, and fertilizer provider, seed provider, who have their own tools. You see the B2B ecosystem platforms, which where, where we see a collaboration between several vendors enabling data sharing. So several of them made together work together on these platforms. We also see national and regional data hubs, data spaces resulting from partnerships, building an ecosystem, for example, in a region or in a member state. And you also see the high value data set examples of like, for example, geospatial spatial data, soil and environmental data that you can make available to the farmer. And all of this has to be, we try to make accessible to what we call the European agricultural data space as kind of a very, very open platform for that. Similar in mobility, you, you see many beneficiaries of mobility platforms and many best benefits. And I think you can, you, you have all experienced with some of this, so easier to find the most suitable travel option. You go on the web, you find your way. Do you take the train, do you take the the plane, what is better? Maybe you also look at the energy footprint or at the CO2 footprint. Monitoring planning management of traffic for your public authorities. When you go in the morning to your office, you want that, you want to get information. What means of, of transport do I use best? Safer mobility, a red light telling you where the problem is. Is there an accident telling you about dangerous? more innovation on AI, more mobility services, like on the scooters that you rent on the street, or others improved operation of your vehicle to extend the time between service intervals, and also sector coupling related to e-mobility with the energy sector. I will not go into this, but I just want to show you the difficult picture, the very complex picture on how we are trying to build this data space, how it works with other sectoral data spaces on the right hand side, and how we have to bring national aspects, the different mobility data spaces in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Finland, in how we bring the national access points for mobility data in and how we try to develop some framework for that facilitates, that simplifies data sharing in the mobility sector. And that also allows to become a kind of a marketplace for data where you can even sell and buy certain data. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to give one example that's pretty much in my heart. That's, that's when you look at the automotive ecosystem. In the past, that was a very simple thing. You had the manufacturer of a car, you had the suppliers of automotive equipment. And last of these, we had technical suppliers, what we call tier one and tier two. Now everybody works with everybody with a lot of new actors coming in and with, with the market. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> and with the market moving to electric cars, autonomous cars in a servitized world, electric, autonomous, servitized, and connected in a connected world. So the, the market is disrupted. And you see that in particular, when you look at what you see in the press about operating system, all the vendors of cars are now teaming up with one or the other on different parts of this, of their, of the car on 
how to work on an operating system because the, the car becomes a, a, a smartphone on wheels with a lot of security requirements and a smartphone on wheels like your, like, like your phone needs an operating system. So an operating system and tools is developed by each of them and it's a huge, huge effort. And you could, you could say that about 80% of the functionality of the operating system is non-differentiating between the different OEMs, between the different vendors. So there is a business case here for working together while at the same time competing. Co-opetition is what that is called. To better abstract from hardware and also to have standardized interfaces to the application. So that's a typical case where at some point I, I would think there are open platforms emerging. So, and I would conclude here in this introduction that open platforms are important for spurring innovation across our economies. I think that became clear from what I said before. Platforms are crucial for mastering complexity and focusing the work of individual companies like SMEs on what they are str strong at and what are their roles. So they don't have to worry about everything around that's offered by the platform. And that makes them, allows them to make money in the platform economy. It's important that European industry becomes much, much stronger a driver of those open platforms of tomorrow. These platforms, many of them will be global. So I'm not saying we need European or German or whatever located platforms. We need global platforms, but European industry must more and more drive these platforms, being drivers in those platforms. And also when you look at the current geopolitical situation of a lot of tensions between world regions, platforms play a key role in this power struggle across the world. And the ones who own or who dominate the platforms have more power than the ones who have to just use these platforms. So that's an introduction and I'm very keen now on hearing the different views in the different sectors that we have here today. And for that, I would like to hand over to Paul Freeman Schneider, who will be moderating the, the session today. And I will step out of this so you do not always also see me on the screen because we're in a kind of a slightly strange setup. I step over there. Yes, thank you. Many thanks, Max. Um, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Good afternoon, uh, my panelists. Um, before moving on, are there burning questions from the audience? So maybe a question to Alex. <clears throat> yes, there are quite a few, but the question is if we can take them now. Maybe take one, two, which are most. Yeah, okay. So there are some general ones and some very specific ones. Um, maybe let's take a general one first. Uh, there was a mention on the value of platforms. And did you connect plans on plans on enforcing regulation on those platforms? The question is, how confident are we on the actual value of those platforms to actually know how to run enforcement? Um, I think you, maybe you we have to distinguish between uh, regulations on platforms um, which are, have a strong market role or dominant market role, what we call gatekeepers. Uh, and there, you know, um, there are regulations coming up in order to to limit their power to open the market again, which is a distortion in the market. Then you have new regulations like the Data Act, um, where, for instance, we want to mandate data sharing in creating a data platform, data economy, where in the beginning the small companies and SMEs are exempted in order not to distort innovation in business. I think there, you know, you have some different uh different levels of, of interaction but i think we won't uh, have the time now to go into that that detail so maybe one more question and then we we move on, we move on. yes so there are certain brands uh, like supermarkets that offer their own products in their own brand preferentially and this is completely okay the question is why have a different approach in the digital world uh, in the the digital world, it's um, there that digital platforms of, often have two sides of the same aspect. On the one hand, um, what we call multi-sided platforms, 
on the one hand, you have sort of a search engine on a, on a platform, for instance, which is well known. But on the other hand, if the search engine not only makes profit for the search function, but also then, you know, has offers, makes special advertisements of products, uh, it means it misuses its market power in one sector to expand and have a dominant position in another sector. And that sort of is not uh, uh, conform with the market rules on their open markets and avoid sort of a, uh, a dominant position is limited to the cutter rights and on, and on that. So here I think there will actions of, of the commission or on the regulatory side. Um, if you operate independently in different markets, it's fine. Maybe Max too. Yeah, I just, I just, I just add. So the traditional model of offering a service is not a problem. I mean, no. under different markets, that's the same as it is in the normal market. The, the problem comes when, for example, when, when you have a search engine and you are offering your own product or you offer the product of somebody who has paid for an advertisement with you as opposed to somebody who doesn't. So, so there, your own interest in promoting something comes in, whereas the interest of the one who just wants to promote it himself is, is, a, is a different interest. And they are conflicting interests. So that is that is what is coming in here. And we have to make sure that these conflicting interests are not misused. So. Good. So I think with that we take on board and we, we move on to, to our agenda. Let's see if I have I can find it. Oh, yes. So again, welcome to um, our, our panelists. Um, we, we have planned two different panels, um, and, uh, and then we have a common panel. In between, you have a short break if you have the time for that. So on the first panel, uh, we, we tackle apps and platforms in the mobility and energy sector. Both sectors are heavily confronted with the, the changes and disruptions through the, the energy crisis and the crisis with Ukraine, which trigger a lot of investments uh, and uh, putting actually user services at risk. So, the panel should report on the role of platforms in mitigating the risks of the, the crisis, illustrate the benefits of the user, and where applicable also, you know, expand where we use platforms. So I would invite Johanna Sanidaki from Attico, as well as Mathieu Antoine, both covering from area, both covering different sectors. So on the one hand, Johanna, she joined Attico already early in 2011, and she's the Director of Innovation and Deployment. Uh, no, sorry. She is the, the Chief Innovation Officer at Attico after being the Director of Innovation and Deployment until March this year. So she, has, she holds a degree in, in law, a PhD in law, and a Master in Law from Leiden University, Master in Arts and Master of Philosophy. So a very diverse background uh, with a long experience in EU affairs and policies. She was the group director in TomTom, Tom, which you all know, the navigation system. Um, she is part of the Attica Innovation Platform for interactive traffic management. She's part also of what we have, the Commission Platform on um, Connected and Cooperated Automated Mobility Platform, the CCAM. And she is best placed in order to report on the role of mobility platforms in that sector. Joanna. So, so. Thank you very much and good afternoon from me too. I will try to share my presentation, my slides. Share. Okay. I hope you can see that. Let me stop looking at myself. Okay, super. So let me uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much, Roloff and uh, and French from the DG Connect and the Connect University. Um, I, I really enjoyed the presentation by uh, Mr. Max uh, Lemke. It's 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 really important to come up with a disclaimer immediately, and this is why I have uh, the platform of platforms in inverted commas, because we are, I'm not going to be talking about a market uh, place. Eh? I'm not going to be talking about a broker. I'm going to be presenting to you what we do in Ethical ITS Europe, and I'll, I'll tell you uh, something about us, uh, some information about us. Um, uh, but we are indeed an ecosystem where everyone works with everyone. So you have vendors and users and, and so on, but we don't uh, sell uh, products. So I'm going to 
uh, concentrate or focus my um, intervention on uh, APIs and standardization more than uh, apps, because the apps are coming from our members. And what do I mean? Um, let me go for the next slide. So we are a public-private partnership, and you see here 130 members that are under the ITCO platform or umbrella or forum. Um, but we are the ITS stakeholders organization. And it, to make it more easy for you, because these uh, logos are very small, what I, my point is that our public authorities and research centers are more than the private sector uh, stakeholders working on connectivity, suppliers, vehicle manufacturers, service providers, traffic and transport. We are all working on mobility. We are a very balanced um, um, platform or, uh, or organization. Uh, our vision, of course, is very much in line with what the, the vision is in Europe and the European Commission. Sustainable mobility, efficient and safe. And of course, our uh, aim is to promote and develop, promote and deploy the intelligent mobility services by providing this multi-stakeholder platform for action. So we are this kind of platform. And to make it easier, Intelligent transport systems is all that there is around related to mobility from traffic management and sensors and navigation and uh, V2X, V2I, multimodality, Internet of Things as this relates to uh, mobility, transport and logistics and drones and parking and everything uh, that is behind these uh, uh, pictures and, and more. Um, we as an organization, we are, as, as I said, membership based. We run innovation and deployment projects, more than 20, actually 27. And we have eight innovation platforms. And that is what I'm going to uh, focus on in this um, presentation. But let me already tell you that we are very much aligned with the sustainability uh, strategy of uh, published by the European Commission. And we have set targets for a partnership that really uh, help will help us prove um, with KPIs how we uh, our work is aligned by setting targets on decarbonization, safety and efficiency, of course, with a barometer that you see in the center of the slide where we are will be measuring and we are measuring our work until 2030. Um, we are working on four focus areas and I wanted to show this to you. Uh, uh, more and more of these areas are blur blurring in mobility, eh? clean and eco mobility roadmaps, a roadmap and, and transport and logistics and urban mobility and, and CCAM are areas that we have a roadmap for each. Uh, actually, I have two examples to show you, but we work on projects that have um, uh, uh, tracks on logistics and we are looking into the clean and eco mobility aspect of it and they are also automated and they are entering the urban environment so it, it is it is really everyone working with everyone for the benefit of of mobility under under uh, the article platform uh, just an example for you to see how we have uh, developed our roadmaps with, of course, consultation with all the members, not only the ethical office. Um, you see the different milestones, but that's not what I wanted to show you. Really, is the the projects that are supporting this platform, these uh, milestones, and the platforms, the innovation platforms that you see in green. So the Mass Alliance TM 2.0 TISA, um, and other activities. And another example here for the CCAM where you see the projects supporting the milestones that we set for our partners and the platforms, the innovation platforms that are supporting the work. TM 2.0, TISA, Sensoris, Adasis, EAVP, DFRS. These don't mean, mean anything to you, of course, because uh, probably because they are acronyms, but I will uh, explain a bit more. Before I go there, I wanted to also say that the sense of a platform uh, that creates an architecture is also found in our uh, projects. Uh, this is a, 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 just an example of the Phoenix projects, a project coming from logistics and transport, where it is developing the first European federated architecture for data sharing on logistics, which sounds like a marketplace and a broker, uh, but it is developing, it is offering this trusted space for uh, data uh, uh, for, for the different vendors and, and users. So let me go to 
what we focus on on ethical because of this multi-sectoral approach we have eight sectors uh, ranging from users to research centers and public authorities as i said with cities and ministries as as members and also service providers and oems and so on we focus on interoperability that is very important and that is what provides you know facilitates the creation of apps but these and and and, and products and services um but th these are happening at the level of our members we at Ethico, we are striving to create an open ecosystem, facilitates these APIs and standards and protocols, and this is what our innovation platforms are doing. And you see this in your slide. So these are innovation platforms you see MASS eh, and uh, ADASIS and SORIS, TISA, TNITS, TM2.0, Data for All Safety, DFRS, and EAVP for the automated valet parking eh, on your slide. Um, on your screen and and these have come up as as uh, gaps identified uh, through the projects that we are running by our members public and private who said okay let's work on um, um, the concept of mobility as a service which started in uh, under under ethical or or let's work on adasis on on adas um, uh, uh, specifications and and so on. So these are um, not funded by the European Commission, although our projects are funded by the European Commission, of course. And these platforms, innovation platforms, bring the industry uh, competitors into competition, as Max was saying, and the public sector as well cooperating. So let me give you a couple of examples. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to talk to you about ADASIS, which is this um, interface specification for Vehicle Horizon, and it defines an appropriate inf interface for exchanging information between the in-vehicle map database, the ADAS, eh, the Advanced uh, Driver Assistance Systems, and automated driving applications. So you have this, uh, um, a lane departure uh, warning and the driver alertness and the adaptive uh, uh, cruise control. And with ADASIS, this uh, is um, a map uh, enhanced driving. Uh, it, it shows you, it gives you access to the, to the map data, to the vehicle position, to the speed, and it helps you with the horizon information so that the, the drivers and the users are uh, aware of what is coming and the, 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 the uh, driving is, is safer and, and, and better. Uh, so the members of this platform, of course, are uh, vehicle OEMs, um, others manufacturers and the industry, and they came with this de facto industry standard. The, the latest uh, version was released in uh, December 21. And that is, the pre it, it also helps with the predictive powertrain control, which uh, 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 contributes to the sustainability targets that we have in our work. Another platform interesting to, to give you some details is the Sensoris, which is this uh, interface, again, specification for um, the information exchange between the in-vehicle sensors and the dedicated cloud, and it enables cloud-based applications and info services. But again, we are staying in the interface specification and we are not going to the APIs. The APIs are to be exploded, uh, exploited and, and uh, uh, created and developed by the, the members of, uh, of um, of the platform and, and uh, in, in, in the entire ecosystem of mobility, of course, it's not uh, staying within the platform. So the value for the citizens, because that was one of the questions of Sensori's uh, innovation platform, is that it enables the collection of real-time vehicle sensor data to be shared and used by services like MAP, uh, healing and update, hazard warning, traffic management, road maintenance, and etc. Um, and another platform, and that's my favorite one because I'm co-chairing this one for years. Again, innovation platform is the TM 2.0. This is not specifications and interfaces. This is a governance uh, discussion and agreement, again, based on this competition, eh? competitors cooperating. 
um, so that there is a, a loop of information in traffic management in the entire value chain, going from the traffic management operators to the road operators to the traffic service providers and to the user of the vehicle and then back so that you have a, a safer and more uh, informed driving. And this is also linked to the uh, uh, sustainability targets as well, because it helps the public authorities that are geofencing for environmental or more reasons uh, um, to co communicate this to the service providers, the traffic service providers, and have them aligned in uh, achieving their public uh, targets. Um, the data that is needed for this, I wanted to give you some more uh, information for this TM 2.0 concept is all the data from the road. So the, the navigation systems, the clouds, the V2I and so on. And it goes, of course, into the data processing and implementation through the, um, the service providers. And then the loop goes back so that you have this origin destination known or the issues on the road, um, obstacles and so on so that the driving is and the traffic management is interactive. And this takes me to the more holistic approach that we are taking. Your Honor, could, could, could you speak up a bit? Yes. Could you speak this, up a bit, yeah. Of course, of course. This is my, my slide before the end. Uh, so this, is, this takes us into the more holistic um, uh, approach towards mobility, where the two platforms of TM 2.0 and Mass Alliance are cooperating into a more a, a, a better cycle eh, of, of or loop of information in the mobility value chain with mobility uh, operators and mass operators and, and, and so on. So that this is a multimodal approach to mobility. And I wanted to, that's my last slide, to show you the Mass Alliance, another innovation uh, platform working on API catalogs and data catalogs on how to achieve that. So these are the examples of our work. And I'm happy to take questions and I'm thanking you for sh allowing me to share this. And apologies for taking longer than. No problem. Planned. Thank you so much. It was very, very um, inspiring. I think before taking questions, I think we take it in the package. I will invite, invite Antoine Mathieu from Elia, uh, the Belgian provider. So uh, Elia is working, uh, is a strategy developer uh, for platformization and consumer centric applications so um, it works um, on um, specific platforms to foster the emergence of new energy services uh, and it's part of the area consumer centric vision uh, called also io energy and we would be happy to to hear about you what is the the platform approach from Elia. so antoine um, the floor is yours Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Rolf, um, and thank you, Max, for having uh, Ilya um, in this panel. Um, before we start, I'm just going to shortly introduce the Ilya Group. Uh, Ilya Group is a transmission system operator uh, group. Uh, we have a transmission system operator in Belgium and one in uh, Germany. We're mostly known for our um, overhead lines, electrical overhead lines that you see along the highways, the cables also that uh, are running be, uh, below our feet. Uh, we're at uh, the highest level of energy, but what we actually mainly do is put at disposal this physical infrastructure to others to um, uh, have the economy functioning uh, 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 and, and deliver uh, that um, uh, energy towards uh, every household. So that's a bit what ELA Group is doing, mutualizing these physical resources. That's what we do. We also tend to um, um, uh, understand that we can have another role and we can also um, use other digital other resources, but then digital resources, um, uh, mutualizing those to get uh, the uh, economy uh, uh, a step further. And that's what I would like to um, expose today, is how can we, um, uh, in, in order to reach also the energy transition in which we are today, how to reach that, um, uh, but then on a reliable and affordable way, uh, but how to reach that with uh, um, uh, better and uh, improved data exchange. Maybe I'll just go to... My next slide. Yes. So um, what we would like to do is, um, and, and in the framework of the current energy uh, crisis that that um, um, has reminded us that the, the com consumers have not yet fully um, benefited um, from from the actions that we have uh, been taken um, to progressively decarbonize uh, our society. Um, but that's also why, and you heard it from, from Rolf, I'm, I'm part of the consumer-centric uh, department, consumer-centricity vision of the ADA group, and we want to bring the consumer really back at the center of, 
of, of the attention. Um, but also uh, make sure that this um, a consumer can receive the energy services that he deserves, he, she deserves, uh, and also that are sustainable, affordable, and uh, secure. We see also that this, this energy transition does not come from nowhere. So it's really connected to, uh, and, and how Ilya Group has seen this, to reducing uh, or, or carbon footprint, uh, reducing um, um, Europe's uh, emissions by 50, 50, 55% in 2030, um, as in the Fit for 55 ambitions, but also reducing our dependency on um, uh, foreign uh, fossil fuels, especially uh, fossil fuel coming from Russia, uh, as we all know. Uh, and which is the ambition of the Repower uh, EU um, plan. So to realize this energy transition and have this dependency and um, reducing our carbon emissions, we need to um, not only install more renewables and continue electrifying, but we also need to make sure that we have the right flexibility to cope with that uh, new um, uh, uh, energy mix that, that we're facing in the future. And what have we how uh, have we coped with um, that in the past well basically we have coped with that uh, by having big dispatchable fossil fuel plants um, installed uh, but we will not be able to do that in the future there's an opportunity here because we know that there's a lot of other decentralized sources and max has mentioned a lot of those batteries cars uh, the 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 the, the, um, uh, the heat pumps that are installed um, um, in every household in the the, the future uh, well basically we can make use of those decentralized sources also to um, 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 help us get to that flexibility. Um, but the thing also is that the ELA group does not believe in doing everything by its own. Um, we don't believe in vertically integrating the whole value chain uh, from uh, the infrastructure to the, the, the household. We're not made for this. So everybody has its own place. We're a public sector uh, actor. We're here to Fire start. We're help. Uh, we're help, helping to put at disposal some uh, mutualized um, um, elements, but we count on others to help us doing that. Um, we really think it's a win-win situation for us getting access to flexibility. It needs also to be a win situation for the consumer in the end. And to make that win situation for the consumer in the end, energy service providers need to come up and and and, and invent those services for the, the, the end consumers. Ilya is not going to do that. Uh, we are not in everyone's household. We're not in everyone's uh, electrical car. We really believe in fostering that innovation, um, believing that uh, others need to start uh, investing. But we received some feedback from those um, um, uh, energy service providers in the past months. And we're really in a, uh, and that's why the Internet of Energy initiative has been started. It's really to start that discussion again, that ecosystem around us not only about technical providers, but really all the different sectors around us. We, we're talking to social housing um, um, uh, organizations, we're talking to the building sector, we're talking to the automotive. Uh, Max mentioned the uh, uh, MOU we have signed with uh, Ellie uh, recently. So we're really looking at that whole ecosystem um, um, to, to, to be able to build those energy ser system, uh, services of the future. Um, these providers of these energy uh, services, they Basically, what we've seen is that they need a couple of elements, and two of them are really the pillars that are behind the um, um, uh, um, consumer centricity vision. And um, those are two of the um, um, elements that you see here on, on the slide. So, data access is one. Um, energy service providers really face some uh, difficulty to um, access um, um, uh, consumer data in the energy sector. And the other element is how can we make sure that we can also have energy transactions happening between the different parties of the energy sector. The third element uh, that you see here is that we also want to um, uh, make sure that um, uh, we decarbonize and so that people are really uh, consuming green energy when that green energy is made available. The goal of today is really to focus on that data access. Um, um, the, 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 and, and so I will continue in, in my presentation on, on have, allowing that data access and how we want to do that. Uh, Traxxas that you see in the middle is the developer platform on which these energy service providers will be able to find those different building blocks that they will use in their own uh, product stacking and that we put in at disposal um, and we mutualize those digital resources for the energy service providers. But how did it, how is it actually happening currently and how do we see uh, the, the issues of today uh, in, in the um, uh, data portability or um, uh, the data exchange uh, in the energy sector? 
Well, basically, we see a lot of locking, um, 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 locking, which is um, a technologically, uh, but also um, economically, um, there is some uh, stakes. So we um, really believe that that um, avoiding that locking uh, and making sure that the, the owner of the data, so the driver, uh, the, the 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 one who's living in in, in his house, uh, heating his house with his heat pump, can really own the data and can actually share that data with the service provider of his choice. We really want to um, push this forward, and that's why we. Um, uh, have the vision to, at least in a uh, first phase, help that um, uh, economy to fire start, that data economy to fire start here, and um, uh, increase competition of services, not only at the head meter, but also behind the meter. So we really are looking for sharing, for example, an electrical vehicle data to an electrical vehicle service provider, uh, if that service provider received the uh, permission uh, of the data owner to um, um, uh, not only Hold, but also process um, uh, his her data. Different elements are required for that. So uh, on the left you see the data providers, and uh, on the uh, right you see the data consumers of so the service providers. In the middle, these regulated tools and um, will be uh, are elements of the platform that we're building, the developer portal that, that we're building. Uh, basically, we need to um, have asset registries. We need to know which assets um, uh, um, uh, we're talking about um, uh, and which data on these assets we are talking about or sharing. We need to make sure that uh, permissions are safeguarded and that um, permissions are shared among the uh, 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 people that um, are on that platform uh, uh, to the ecosystem. Uh, and the last point is the uh, communication platform. We need to make sure that that um, um, data is actually flowing, not on a 15 minute exposed data, but even closer to real time. Because we know that um, uh, the energy sector is going to react just really quick and so basically we want to increase that um, 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 reaction also by providing data at the right moment. This brings me to uh, my uh, uh, last uh, uh, slide um, here. Um, basically what we really, and to wrap up, um, basically what we really want to do is um, uh, provide access to real-time data to uh, energy uh, as a service uh, providers, and so these service providers. We want to develop this level playing field uh, 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 for these providers, we want to increase trust uh, for the, the, the consumers uh, so that they uh, not only uh, see that there is an economy building up here, but that there is also some standards that are people that play referee at one point uh, so that they can enter this market uh, safely, securely. They have uh, this, this confidence in, in, in the market. Um, we also want to reduce the um, uh, barriers to entry. Um, we know that getting access to the data today, the price that some of the uh, data providers are putting on the market avoid service providers to build uh, innovative um, services. So we want to lower those barriers. And uh, lastly, also we want to uh, avoid locking. We want to foster uh, this um, um, uh, energy data market uh, by connecting data providers to service providers. We've seen that some of the service providers don't even know where to get the data uh, they need. Uh, so these are, um, in a nutshell, uh, elements that uh, we, we are working on. And uh, uh, to, to, to end the, this presentation, we are really open to collaborate. So um, um, I've mentioned the automotive, I've mentioned the um, uh, building sector, but there's many more uh, sectors, banking, telecom, that we're working with uh, so that we can uh, go for a uh, uh, decarbonized and uh, um, uh, affordable energy transition uh, um, um, within within Belgium, Germany, but also across Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, fully agree, the exciting times. Um, just to quickly wrap up, um, yes, you both mentioned particularly mobility side. You know, there's a, a pool of information out in order to improve mobility services and go to the next level. Uh, the question for you is, you know, how to steer innovation mainly through enabling like you know opening and opening up interoperability apis we have also seen in the energy sector you know there are low-hanging fruits you know connecting mobility to energy and again to make it happen you create a sort of a platform uh, um, doing the apis and the the open interfaces uh, opening up the data sharing enabling it but so far um we don't have an app so the consumer is not in the loop both for the mobility or the energy so question from the audience, what is your um, take on what sort of burning questions you have? So 
we have some questions. Um, one was regarding partners. There was a cycle mentioned. The question being, how often do you look at that cycle to refresh it? And which from the PPP uh, partnership, which uh, of the partners is more active? And is there any reason behind that? There was a question for Johanna. Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, that, that was not clear to me from uh, the, the cycle. What to I can repeat? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So you mentioned, you mentioned uh, I think in one of your last slides, the, you had a cycle that you are uh, running with together with your partners. The question is, how often do you look at that cycle to refresh it and make sure it's up to date? And which uh, partners are more active? within that cycle and maybe why yes thank you thank you for the question uh, the cycle was uh, the um, multi the the mobility network management concept that we are working on with the two innovation platforms of tm 2.0 and the mass alliance and this is a cycle of data eh? the, the 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 data loop let's say the information loop uh, and and this is supposed to be real uh, real time uh, data and traffic information and multimodal information. So it, it's supposed to be, um, yeah, refreshed as, as fast as possible. There's no specifications yet because, as I said, it's a it's a work on governance and how to to make this work architecture-wise. But we haven't reached the point where we are standardizing or uh, having the specifications agreed on interfaces and so on. If that, I hope that answers the question. And the partners, yes. because sorry to to because I, the I there was a second uh, part of the question. So the partners are the in in the the last cycle, which was the mobility network. It was all the mobility service providers, the traffic management, uh, the different modes, uh, all the stakeholders mm -hmm. involved in the T in the TM two point zero, the traffic management, the road based only. It was the um, the traffic uh, uh, centers, the service providers, and the road operators. These were the partners and the user, of course. Eh? Mm -hmm. Understood. And maybe a question for both, actually, uh, because we did mention competition, or at least a competition, a healthy competition environment. The question is. Do you have any insights in the value of consumer data to know how best we can foster a good competition environment? Value of consumer data, yes. So that is that is the key, eh? consumer data, and and the entire cooperation, which is this uh, cooperation among competitors, is is based on that uh, on the on the uh, prospect that this uh, consumer data is open and shared with their consent, of course, um, and and there's the same applies for the sum of the data of the competitors. Uh, we have seen, uh, as an insight, I can share in the um, in the process of these discussions and uh, and work that we're doing in the TM 2.0 in the Mass Alliance, um, we have seen this resistance or reluctance. Uh, uh, from the private sector to share all the data, because as you can imagine, that's a bread and butter. So that is uh, part of the discussion on the business models and how this can work best. <clears throat> I, can, I can only, yes. um, maybe I can contribute a bit on that as well. Uh, it, it, indeed, uh, as, as uh, Joanna said, uh, the billion dollar uh, question. Huh? So um, what's the value of data, uh, of consumer data? Uh, we, we don't really know yet, and that's why I think it's, we're not yet settled uh, because not all markets are mature uh, already. Um, and, um, um, Max was mentioning this super app that everybody would have on its phone to manage uh, uh, everything that's related to the energy, uh, whether that's one uh, app provider or many app providers, many platforms that actually can provide that. That's another discussion. But if you look at um, if we don't have all these services already, uh, and if you see that um, people don't know yet how to settle on a 
price for exchanging that data is that we have not discovered that value yet. Not everybody knows um, uh, yet what uh, uh, the value is, but also which data we're talking about. So this is really something that we need to discover in those innovation cycles. And, 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 and I can only follow uh, uh, Joanna here, who um, uh, having these broad ecosystems, talking to a lot of uh, people together, uh, bringing together, making sure that we can do some tests, some uh, innovation uh, uh, projects together, we will discover what this value actually is. Um, so that, that's my intake uh, on, 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 on the value. That's a fair point, actually. You mentioned it's a million dollar question, but then again, we might not even know. Maybe it's two millions, maybe it's three millions. I said billion, so, I said billion. So um, uh, two billion. <laughs> even closer then, even closer, indeed, indeed. So let's take one more question, actually, before uh, taking a short five minute break. Uh, maybe it's a bird question, but. Uh, it does come from the audience, so let's see. Which changes in policy would you see helping best foster a healthy competition in your area? Yeah, that is a difficult question. Um, <laughs> how to foster a healthy competition? Uh, we believe that... Um, First, you have an agreement among the stakeholders, uh, public and private, on how to cooperate, and then you come up with policy. Policy should be supporting and not imposing. Having said that, uh, um, uh, we have uh, this agreement on on cooperating, especially in the in the uh, interactive traffic management example with the circle that we were discussing just now. Um, Fostering this competition means that you and that the policy enables um, uh, no doesn't doesn't punish the 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 ones the the stakeholders that open up their data, but makes life difficult if I can use that word for those who do not want to cooperate. And what do I mean? In, as an example, in this uh, traffic management, interactive traffic management, when you have all the service providers that are competing with each other, like uh, TomTom and Here and uh, Be Mobile and what have you, uh, agreeing to share data with the public authorities and traffic management centers, and then you have others that do not enter this competition, this uh, this agreement, then it's not a level playing field and it's unfair to those who agreed to cooperate. So on the one hand, you need incentives for the partners that are cooperating and uh, uh, yeah, taking these incentives away or not uh, providing, uh, or opening up the public information to those who don't agree to cooperate. That is That is what policy should be doing. Mm -hmm. Antoine, maybe yeah. a short question, a short answer. Yeah, sure answer. I think I think what, what the policies that have been put up for the moment go in the right direction. I think we need to continue working on those. Um, uh, it's it's I think the the right direction, and uh, indeed by bringing and having these public-private um, uh, agreements on on that, we will reach at one point uh, um, um, and, and be able to move on. Uh, but I think we really go into the right, the right direction. So I don't have a specific point to say, okay, this needs to change or something that's really difficult question. But I think the different policies that have been put up until now go into that right direction. Okay, okay, we are back. Uh, we were able to reset the, the equipment. Um, so we'd like to draw your attention to the second panel, um, which focuses on a different platform approach. From the point of view, what we call a cooperating system as well as a farming platform. So um, we heard, you know, it's a challenge, you know, to get access to data, to pool data from the mobility and the energy platform. We focus now, you know, how to integrate different stakeholders in order to make something happen, really, you know, in the field or um, for uh, a car to build up um, emerging applications, emerging computing and data infrastructure which has uh, real implications on the operation of a device or um, of uh, an infrastructure. So I'm very happy to welcome two speakers, um, Francesca Flamini from TT Tech and Jürgen van Geite from ILVO. Um, I see Francesca, Jürgen, are you online? Ah, yes, I can see you as well. 
So let me start with Francesca. So Francesca basically was a former colleague of us. We were working together, you know, quite a while ago in, at that time in embedded systems um, and control and manufacturing. Uh, you are now manager of the innovation projects in TTPEC, uh, uh, an Austrian company. Um, so you have a background in mechanical engineering uh, and a PhD in design and methods in industrial engineering, so you're well suited. Uh, and you work with a, quite a number of TT Tech's research um, projects, and you're well aware of the research agenda. So, please, Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will share my screen. And I will... Okay. Um... Yeah, we can see it. Fine. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just first uh, do an introduction of uh, TT Tech, uh, uh, TT Tech Auto and uh, TT Tech Group uh, in general. So, TT Tech is a company that uh, is uh, leading in a real-time networking platform and uh, safety control. Uh, so the the group uh, the TT Tech group uh, uh, offers solution uh, for uh, safety and reliability in electronic systems uh, in the industrial and uh, transportation sectors, and we are based in Vienna, as Rolf mentioned, in in Austria. We started as a spin-off of uh, Technical University of Wien back in 1998. And currently, we have uh, more than uh, 2,300 people working with us. Uh, we also have uh, uh, expanded from Vienna. We have a global footprint now with the uh, offices and uh, research and development teams in uh, um, 19, uh, in 14 countries in uh, US, uh, Europe, uh, and Asia. And uh, it's I will focus my presentation indeed in uh, uh, automotive platform and uh, TT Tech Auto, in fact, uh, focus on uh, digital platform for specifically highly uh, automated vehicles. So uh, the, the presentation will focus on platform for system level orchestration of the software defined vehicles from concept to reality. Um, Yeah, so first uh, I will give them a, a, a bit of a um, market concept. Um, uh, just a second, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm, I have an issue. We are, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but I also have sometimes it doesn't move forward. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Um, so the market concept, concept uh, we see uh, that uh, um, the automotive industry is going, is moving toward um, a centralized uh, uh, vehicle uh, EE architecture uh, with the scope the final goal of introducing what we called the software defined vehicles. This is uh, is something that uh, uh, reflect different uh, changes uh, in in a global uh, perspective of the, how the uh, the vehicle is used, what are the new roles uh, of and business model for the car makers, but more importantly on what are the expectation of uh, of the end user, because uh, we see that uh, the end user, uh, as you also mentioned in the, in the previous presentation, is uh, is. Uh, influenced by this concept of uh, connectivity, uh, entertainment, uh, device and platform. And, uh, and so basically we see that uh, there is a more customer and application centric approach that uh, in, will, is changing and impose very many challenges to the whole uh, automotive uh, supply chain. And uh, this the, the car is, uh, is, is not uh, the same as an iPhone on wheel. Uh, it's much more complex. And uh, so it needs uh, to uh, um, address a specific integration and, and the realization issue. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 
the safety is uh, is an aspect that in a car is uh, is not uh, negotiable. Uh, of course, are the real time behavior is also expected and is the sh is essential for many uh, vehicle function and also level four autonomous driving uh, bring the fail operational uh, system requirement that are uh, important uh, and validation verification uh, strategy are also needed to, to be considered for uh, for this type of uh, uh, of uh, platform um, so on, on top we see uh, also a change from uh, this vertical uh, uh, oriented um, development approach to a more um, um, horizontal and uh, platform centric approach with new cooperation model that uh, come into into play so here is uh, uh, indeed uh, this uh, um, uh, in, uh, a trend that we see um, uh, where uh, OEM uh, we are working uh, and moving from a uh, distributed EE architecture that can no longer cope with the complexity um, of the of the software uh, um, of the software uh, that is required in a, in a, in a modern car towards domain based uh, architecture where all the pieces of software that belongs to a specific domain are put together in bigger ECU uh, with multiple COCs uh, that requires a bandwidth uh, uh, interconnection uh, and uh, uh, between SOC within the, the, the ECU. Uh, tomorrow we see that uh, the, the, the use case of tomorrow uh, are um, going towards higher integration with the one or two um, central computing box uh, uh, and zonal controller that uh, have an, a high number of function um, that by having a, num a high number of function uh, generate, the, generate a lot of uh, cabling, a lot of uh, uh, separate box that cannot be afforded anymore. And so uh, there is uh, the, the trend to combine this function in local controller uh, that can be managed uh, um, uh, can be managed better from the integration point of view, from the load uh, distribution point of view, etc. Um, yeah. Uh, so we see here this uh, this change from uh, vertical to uh, horizontal um, uh, approach. In the, um, in the in the in the supply chain, so uh, uh, the, the OEM uh, are uh, extending from their traditional system uh, spe specification and integration role uh, with developing also in-house software development capabilities, and this uh, for a cooperation model are um, are changing, opening also for uh, new roles for uh, emerging also in the in the automotive industry and this uh, it's a it's a way also to open up to to new entrant uh, as it was uh, mentioned before um, where um, for example a company like us uh, i mean tier one or uh, tier one and a half supplier in, uh, of soft, software supplier can work uh, and can bring market ready platform centric uh, uh, software solution OEM uh, and uh, um, um, software um, application developer can work um, separately from uh, hardware um, uh, hardware company, hardware supplier, um, and then uh, in this uh, innovation platform, uh, with this approach, uh, they, uh, it will be uh, uh, easier uh, to um, to uh, operate the, uh, the the integration at uh, at system level. Yeah. So from system architecture understanding, what we propose uh, and uh, what we see is uh, this um, uh, uh, enabling this uh, CAR OS um, uh, operating, uh, the CAR operating system that enable uh, the fast, faster innovation cycle 
for this in vehicle software application for connectivity, networking, high performance uh, chips, uh, also supporting, uh, supported by, by a strong cloud infrastructure uh, that enable also new business models, new monetization opportunities for uh, the car makers while still protecting uh, and uh, um, as you can see on the on the right, uh, maintaining the, the safety and security and the, the real time uh, are the real time performance uh, and upgradable uh, capability uh, of the of the platform. And so this all this aspect uh, can be maintained with this new CarOS approach, uh, and also the cloud services um, are in in a, an integral part of this. Uh, platform first cloud first system architecture um, or how we see it and uh, it's also important uh, uh, that this car os uh, enable uh, the stronger reuse uh, a stronger use uh, potential of the software uh, and synergies but also uh, it's ready to implement also new uh, uh, the newest uh, um, demand and uh, specific feature uh, from uh, from OEM. Uh, this also the the use of the cloud will enable testing uh, in the cloud, uh, validation and verification of software application to uh, allow 100% uh, safety and security to the behavior in the vehicle, and. CT Tech, uh, as a company, we are we have a strong expertise in safety and security, and so we also bring to this CarOS all this uh, this uh, uh, expertise. Um, and last on the market, we we see um, why we see this is important because we see that uh, the value um, the, uh, the 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 money goes into the software is increasing. Um, especially the share that goes in uh, middleware iOS and also um, autonomous driving uh, application, ADAS and AD application. Uh, and so this translates for us in the relevance of having this platform software, uh, this software platform, because this reduces the, uh, the, the, the complexity of the integration. Um, and also uh, what we call the, the orchestration layer to uh, allow this uh, uh, integration and also execution of the software um, um, easily. So what we propose is the, the Save Vehicle software platform. And in particular, we have a platform uh, called MotionWise, which uh, we think can master the complexity, the integration complexity in the in the automotive uh, software along two dimensions. So one dimension is this vertical dimension. So um, as we said, uh, it's possible to um, to decoupling uh, the hardware and the software. Uh, and so that allows the, the um, a device independent software development. Uh, and uh, so the car makers or uh, can evolve their software function independently from the the hardware uh, function because as we know we have they have different uh, um, innovation cycle and this uh, decoupling this uh, abstraction layer um, allow this uh, faster uh, innovation cycle on on both uh, side um and on the overall, we also support the end-to-end uh, -end development uh, life cycle. So all the phases of the of the life cycle of uh, of, uh, of the safety critical uh, and not critical application. So from design, planning, development, validation and verification, certification, deployment and operation. Francesca, could you? Yes, I'm I'm almost yeah. done. Okay. 
I just want to uh, highlight uh, this, this slide uh, on the, this orchestration uh, of application. So we define, we identify these three layers. So there is the um, SOC layer, so the la SOC level, the uh, level one, layer one, which is in charge of the management of the silicon capability of the sensor. And this layer is managed by normal standard operating system. While we intervene, uh, our car OS intervene at the domain control unit level, so the OS lay layer two, uh, where there are different uh, uh, automotive, um, um, already uh, standardized automotive uh, um, uh, software stack like Autosar, uh, but we provide a sort of middle uh, middleware layer uh, which include networking management, application orchestration, end-to-end -end, uh, ex -end execution, end-to-end -end, uh, time, uh, global scheduling and execution guarantee. And uh, at the vehicle level, so the OS layer three, this is a new level because it includes both in vehicle but also uh, cloud resources. Um, because now we see that uh, some application don't, do not need to run in the car, but can be run, can be executed uh, by, uh, in the cloud. And this is thanks to 5G networks and, uh, and others. Uh, and also here, uh, this is the novelty and uh, the car OS will play a, a crucial uh, role. Um, this, this said, this is important, but we do not have to forget uh, safety and security uh, by design um, where, um, I'm going here, uh, we see that uh, reusing this safety software platform across OEM um, uh, will speed up the SOPs for, uh, for, for OEMs, uh, and this uh, will help uh, our platform to expand uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the global footprint. And last uh, slide. What we see in, uh, in uh, the key takeaways for us in the, for this presentation is that uh, the, the future car will change at runtime and four aspects are important. So the, to be responsive to this change, certain technology needs to support the dynamic behavior and enable this seamless operation of the system. On the other side, design practice need to change. So uh, transitioning from design time to runtime approach, and also this uh, software uh, as a service business model. So the, the behavior of the vehicle uh, shall adapt to the software and the user need while keeping uh, uh, the integrity of the system in terms of safety and security untouched. And so this OS layer two and three will be uh, enabler to accommodate this, uh, this new option leveraging also with uh, online techniques for reconfigurability of the vehicle. And last aspect is related to cloud where company need will need and will leverage more on a cloud-based uh, digital twin, uh, especially for testing, validation and verification and certification aspect uh, uh, to be able to uh, ensure the correctness of the behavior of the vehicle. And with that, I thank you very much, and I give back the floor to Rolf. Thank you, Francesca, for the insights, the technical insights in the new generation of designing the car and the car operating system. Uh, we take questions again in the package, so I first want to move on to farming. So you have seen already the change of, of atmosphere or culture you know, from the previous um, panel to this one. We have to talk about operations now, and we see on the operations that um, the value of data applications, um, the orchestration of the local control and the local decision making with cloud service and data service becomes more prominent. And that's also the case for the farming sector. For well, the farming sector, the digital farmer of today has to take much more complex decisions and is much more supported by data applications. I'm very happy to welcome Jürgen van Geite, Jürgen is already, thank you for your time because you're also part of a conference today and you've taken your time. You are the scientific director um, for agriculture engineering at ILVO. 
And Ilvo is the Flanders Research Institute for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, um, basically with a focus on environmental technology, precision crop farming and precision livestock farming. And you have a track record in agricultural engineering. We are very happy to have you here and to introduce the De Just Connect platform for the farmers. Jürgen, the okay. floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Actually, um, I'm at the kickoff meeting, but as a, of a very related project, it's called uh, Data for Food 2030. It's a Horizon Euro project, and it's all about uh, building the future data economy. So it's mm -hmm. it's really on spot of this uh, of this discussion. So thank you very much. Um, I will not talk too much about Ilvo. I mainly want to talk about uh, our pro our um, platform and what we are doing in uh, agriculture. Um, I think uh, Just Connect can really serve as an example of a sustainable data sharing initiative in uh, in agriculture. We are actually, in our opinion, one of the first regional data spaces in uh, in, in agriculture, and we also stretch uh, towards food. Um, why are we there? I'm just going to put this away. Yes. Okay. Well, I think I don't need to say to this public that there are a lot of possibilities in the data economy, also in agri-food, and we see a lot of use cases where we see valorization possible of data. We see a lot of companies that uh, have data where they could reach new clients, that they could um, do better marketing of their data and the services, and that they could offer better strategy. But on the other hand, we see not so many players already valorizing this full potential, and they're not really not so much player already that I think that are making real value already through data sharing. So there's a lot, lot to be done. and. A lot of uh, uh, companies in our sector need to think about what is our digital strategy. And, and more than just being a platform for data sharing or a data space, we are also trying to navigate our ecosystem, our digital ecosystem in this uh, digital uh, journey. Um, to make it maybe a little bit practic uh, practical, uh, what you can have, for instance, um, a new company, uh, um, a startup who, who wants some data sets to give advice for the, for the, on a farmer. Let's say that he wants to combine genetic data, that he wants to combine uh, data coming from the milk quality and maybe the feed that the, the animals get. And all this data, this data is not necessarily with the farmer, it's mostly with with, with, with the businesses and then he has to contact this uh, dairy business or the feed businesses to make an agreement with this business to get the data but of course he needs to make many agreements because a smart app is not using just one data source it's it's combining a lot of different uh, data sources so the first step is to bring all these agreements together and then at least in our vision and also the, the, the vision, um, the European vision on data ownership, uh, he needs to get consent of uh, all these farmers that they don't have the data on premises, but their data is with the businesses that are delivering to them. So we need to see that these uh, farmers can make an agreement and give their consent on the use of this data. And connected to this consent, there is a value exchange. It can be money, but it can also be another value proposition. So this com becomes a very complex system. For me, as a data user, I need to connect to a lot of data sources, I need to have a lot of consents, I need to do a lot of negotiations. So all these consents, uh, all these um, uh, work to get to the data makes it a very, very complex system. And we like to refer to it with the image of a spaghetti. Uh, for the data user, it, it, it's really becoming way too complex and um, there is you will lose too much value in finding your way in this complex system. And for our farmers, on the other hand, they're overwhelmed by um, companies asking consent for their data. And this is actually the, 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 the problem where we are confronting with. I can try to, to picture it for you a little bit in, an, in, an, in another way. Uh, we see four levels of data sharing. In the early days, because data sharing is not new, uh, people have been uh, sharing data already even before digitization was there. Um, data could be shared in a, in a more um, classical way through FTP service, but you can even share a data in, in, in hard copy or in documents. But what I'm trying to picture here is that we share mostly in, 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 a, in, a, in a circle of trust. We share with our direct partners, with the business players that we know. And in data sharing, 2.0, we saw a digitization of the data sharing, but the main concept stayed the same. You only share with the people you know. And then we had the API and the cloud services coming in, but still, um, we were still sharing with people we know, people we can trust, so we didn't need so much uh, governance or technology to create trusted data sharing. But now we are moving to the next level. We are offering data as a product, and we are sharing our data with players and third parties that we don't know. 
and then there is some danger because we're not anymore in the circle of trust we're not anymore sharing data with trusted parties and we believe this is an unstable system and and this is cracking and this cracking is a loss of, of trust and of stability what we propose is to build again uh, a stabilized data ecosystem for sharing build uh, which is built on three very important components as a basis we tr we see trust and as a support we see a very important uh, strong infrastructure and another maybe the most important component respect uh, and this is actually what we integrated in our in our data platform uh, just connect um, the platform is not just a, a project or it, it originated from 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 research but the platform is really out there we connect real farmers we connect real businesses we have a sustainable business model uh, developed for the moment so we are really out there in the system but taking step by step it's not that we already are connecting the full Flemish ecosystem of farmers uh, I want to be very clear and transparent on that um, I talked about these components in, let's first look at infrastructure we have built one open platform and as a support for this platform it was very important that we chose the right partners and we chose to work only with cooperative um, actors. So all the actors that uh, supported us from the beginning in the financing way and that are um, part of the governance structure of Just Connect are um, companies owned by farmer or with very uh, strong relationships with the farmer. We are in dairy, um, in feed. We have uh, a very strong support also from the, the Belgium uh, uh, other Flemish farming organizations. We are uh, in, in genetics and, and, and health, but all these companies have an, an, a cooperative background. And of course, we started uh, when we were still a project with uh, support of uh, the European Union, and we still do a lot of our innovations. Uh, we are part of uh, the, we are building the European um, common data space on agriculture. We are part of several uh, large research projects and also digital Europe programs where we are uh, using the innovation potential that these projects offer us to renew our uh, um, our data space all the time. And we are now moving to be a federated data space, also looking into possibilities as Gaia-X and, uh, and the new connectors that are coming up. So returning a little bit back to this picture, huh, we I said it's it's a very complex system between the data user and the data provider, which we like to compare with this spaghetti system. Everybody is sharing with everybody, and it's very unclear. We are changing this to a kind of circular highway. We like to picture just connect as a data highway where each data user, data provider, can have his own exit and ramp towards the uh, the highway or off the highway and data flows on the highway and what we do is we transport data from one player to another but we only transport data between actors if you play it by uh, the rules our rules of uh, respect and we have connectors we have an api management we have a connect shop where, we, where you can see all the, the the data sources that we have available and where you can easily connect with with our platform um maybe focus a little bit on this 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 important component respect uh, we were actually very much helped there by uh, a code that exists it's the EU code of conduct on agricultural data sharing by contractual agreement and I will not go too much into detail on this but the main uh, uh, part of this agreement or of this code is that you respect the farmer as the owner or the original of the data he has to stay in control he has to give uh, consent and actually what we did is we uh, changed this uh, uh, code into a digital platform actually we digitized the code of conduct and what happens let's say this app provider wants to use uh, the data from a data provider let's say the, the dairy in industry then he first the dairy uh, the dairy uh, business has to say our or the feed business uh, it's mostly a business actor needs to uh, be open to share the data and then the next step the most important step is that the farmer will get uh, um, informed and the farmer has give has to give his consent if the farmer doesn't give any consent there will flow there will be no data flowing on our uh, on our platform so um we, we further uh, build this by giving the farmer a, a true dashboard a very nice overview on how he is sharing his data and to do the identity management uh, we are using um, the, the technology uh, uh, available uh, to do to do the to the to do the identity management and it's exactly the same technology that, that we um, 
that is also available, for instance, for farmers if they have to apply for their taxes or whatever uh, official connection they need to do with the government. So they know the system very well. It's easily for a farmer to identify himself. And then he gets um, uh, a very nice overview of all data requests. And he can say yes or no, depending on uh, whether he trusts the company or not. And also the company needs to explain each time very clearly the goal, how long and how long the data uh, will be used so if the if the company is not clear on that just connect will not forward the request to the farmer so um, maybe uh, coming to a summary uh, what does just connect offer uh, what, what is our offer we offer uh, one data market the data market is our connect shop we make their data available for the whole sector because we are an open platform we, we do it in a safe, transparent and controlled way. We transport your data, but we are open to everybody. Everybody who wants to play by our rules can join. We give one clear dashboard to the farmer where he is in full control of his data and he can decide with whom he wants to share the and why. And all these services come with one very clear contract. So the, the, the farmer does not get any other contract depending on which company asks the data. Also towards our, our business partner, there's one clear contract for the whole uh, platform. Um, with who do we interact? Of course, farmers and, uh, and, and also horticulturists, but we are there for the data provider and also for the data consumer. That um, is all probably already very clear from my talk. And just as a final slide, I want to show you our Connect Shop, where you can easily go if you wonder which data are, is this platform already offering. You have a very nice uh, system with cards where you can click on and then you can see uh, which data is available and uh, how you can get uh, to, the, to the data. Uh, I hope I didn't take too much of your time, but um, I hope I was quite clear what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jürgen. Just in time, just do it, that's fine. So <laughs> great, great insights in an operational platform for farming, and we've seen a platform approach which already you know, made it to a marketplace. So we have an economic model um, and uh, some incentives for the people you know in order to have some contractual agreements. So we take questions now from the audience to either Francesca or to uh, Jürgen. You take the question, yes. So indeed, thank you. Um, that's an, actually an interesting uh, topic that, that you choose, uh, the last one. Coincidentally, we also had yesterday on our session of Web3, uh, one of the speakers had a project on tokenization in agriculture. So where they were providing various or additional value streams to the farmers themselves via tokenization. So it's interesting to see that uh, our sessions are related somehow, even though they are so wide in their approach, we can still see common points and we can still see reasoning and why we do this. In terms of questions, there are some specific ones and some more uh, broad. Uh, let's see maybe some general ones. Let's call it in terms of education. Now, education doesn't always mean like pedagogy. It can also mean what we do today, sharing knowledge with uh, people, stakeholders, people involved in the world. Do you see any good efforts in education in the projects which you are part of? So that can be education of stakeholders themselves. For example, in teaching farmers what exactly can they do with data or teaching the uh, uh, producers what or whom they can share their uh, data with and what can that mean for them? Do you see any good efforts in the area? I don't know because you mentioned farmers. Maybe maybe I I will start, but I I think there's a huge uh, and 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 let's be honest, there is already a huge effort coming from the Commission to provide farmers with with better skills and also to to support them with advisors that can help them with this. But there's still a lot to be done. It's it's still um, not easy to explain to farmers the the possibilities of data sharing. Um, to make him see what, what, how they could benefit from that. And that also starts with some understanding. You don't need to be an IT expert, but you need basic understanding of some um, uh, digital skills. And then there, I think we, we, we see a 
also positioned by um, uh, not just training the farmer, but also the advisory services around the farmer. If they can be there to support the farmer in, in these platforms coming up, I think this is a, this is a very, uh, very important uh, step. So yes, there is a need for education and there is also a need maybe for um, a next farmer, a farmer that is more used to look at the dashboards to take decisions based on data, to work data driven, and maybe less directly connected with his machinery and being on his tractor, that might be a new kind of uh, farmer, but uh, there will be all kinds of different types of farmers, of course, in the future. Maybe a question for Jessica, do you need a need for new skills in, your, in that current transition? Uh, definitely yes. Uh, we 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 see that uh, there is a, a lack of uh, software engineer, uh, especially, uh, um, and there is a war for uh, trying to get uh, the the one that are on the market uh, between companies. Uh, and uh, yes, so we need. Uh, we think that uh, we there should be an investment on on that to try to. Uh, to bring more software engineer, more IT um, uh, engineer in the uh, in the uh, in the job market. Good. A specific question, I think it would be for uh, Francesca. So there was a question on reconfiguration. The question was, would the reconfiguration be done by users or would that be done by designers or producers themselves? I think the direction being, do we let more, let's say, autonomy to the users or do we trust the designers, the production, etc., to be in charge of what's best for the users? Um, well, and, and at the moment, what we see is that uh, so the, the development of, uh, of functionality and application is on the uh, software uh, player. Uh, it's a complex. Um, it's not like uh, the the application, as we said, that uh, we see on the on the app phone, uh, on the uh, on the iPhone, on uh, so on the smartphones. These are uh, require specific knowledge. Require, as I said. Uh, Software engineering skills, especially on uh, embedded system security, um, safety approaches. So, uh, for this function, I don't see that uh, the, the 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 user will uh, uh, can play a role on that. Um, so it will be more uh, on the, on the on the OEM side, I would say. Indeed, like in very complex areas, it's quite difficult to let uh, users be in charge. But I think maybe it ties up a bit with what we spoke earlier. As long as we have good education in the middle, so we understand what's what at stake, then at least we get a better understanding from, uh, from both sides. There is a common question, which maybe uh, we could approach as, as a Closing statement maybe for you as well. If you were to solve one issue in the data space tomorrow, which issue would you choose? Um, okay, I will go first then. Um, uh, I think the next challenge for us is a business model for federated data sharing. Uh, I will explain shortly. At this moment, our business model is quite um, sustainable because we share in a regional data space between our actors now, but, in the, but we see that other data spaces or regional data spaces are also coming up. You have a platform in France where we are cooperating with. There are um, platforms in, in Germany, in the Netherlands. How can we offer to our European uh, players that if they are connected in Flanders, they can also be automatically connected in Germany, in France, and then they don't need to pay a subscription fee each time again. And what business model is necessary to make these platforms uh, work together? So an, an, um, an, a collaborative uh, business model there, uh, that would be a, a very nice next step, I think.
Okay. I'll go ahead. Yeah, Francesca, you have an idea? I thought maybe Antoine, uh, as you like. I think our focus was it's not uh, a lot on the on the data. Uh, it's more on the technological platform. So probably uh, the other panelists uh, have uh, more insight on uh, on this question. I can only share the insights of um, of Jurian uh, here um, uh, as well. Uh, what, what what Jurian has been showing is um, um, something that is not applicable only in the food and agriculture agriculture but also um, um, in, in the energy sector so i can only stand behind uh, this point here i agree to this uh, federated data sharing it's exactly what we're doing in napcor eh? in the napcor project with the national access points where we are also participating so that you have this uh, um, yeah this this federation in the data sharing and the openness and um it's 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 it, it enhances the the um, the fair play the yeah yeah i think definitely i think that was also you know when i, I talked we talked about the, the common panel i raised the question you know um what role of data platforms you see you know to expand beyond the current um space or the current sectors uh maybe one of the answers um, I would also like to take up a further question when I put up, you know, uh, what would you see as the main obstacles or what would be the main means to steer consensus across the different actors uh, of the value chain? Um, well, how would you, what you see, you know, what, what, what should be, what is the driver for that one? Um, is it a, a discussion only on APIs or uh, it's a discussion, you know, on or uh, experimental facilities, or it's a discussion on um, sandboxes to try it out. What do, you, what do you see? What are the main means to see this consensus to support a common platform? I think sandboxes, are, uh, if I'm allowed to, to be the answering first, I think sandboxes is a good idea. Sandboxes, pilots, and, and all the, the, the means that the EU funding is providing through projects is a good idea on um on it, it gives a good opportunity to stakeholders that are competing to try and find business models that are not that are uh, supporting this open ecosystems and the and the apis and the sharing of data without hurting their business model this is this is a good trial and error process that uh, everyone needs uh, to to go through in order to to find the the, the golden yeah uh, line eh, the solution. Yes, yeah, I I could only agree because um, um the, the problem now is that we have these emerging use cases, but we put a lot of effort now ourselves in trying to set up use cases, sandboxes, name it like you wish. But we need more possibility to experiment and to show to the others that it can work. Because at this moment, only the very first adopters are stepping into it, and it's 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 a real uh, pain to to get the first use cases off the ground. And I think these um it would be very nice, and it would also be very nice if we could look into uh, sandboxes where we could go over different verticals like for instance agriculture energy agriculture tourism uh, this is also i think uh, the next step uh, to be taken other comments um if not um i may go take one one more question one more uh, questions um the question is about the investments. At the end of the day, you know, if you talk about agreements on APIs, if you talk about uh, agreement on contracts, uh, at the end of the day, you know, if you talk about the particular data um, spaces or data platforms, somebody has to make the investments into an infrastructure and has to take a lead. Um, so why is it important to put investments in these operational or data infrastructures? And what are the main means in order to, to get the money around? Um, is it, you know, regional funding? Uh, is it, uh, you need lead companies doing the first step in and doing the investments? Or, how, or what or is it um, um, strategic partnerships who are doing the first step? In? So how to, 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 to trigger these investments?
Okay, um, <laughs> but I don't want to be the one. Um, I think uh, I, we, we can be uh, very transparent on that. Um, like our platform could not um, be sustainable at this moment is there is there if when there is there no uh, governmental or institutional support being it from european research project or other sources we are not ready yet um uh, so we have a sustainable business model but we need another several years to um to be really uh, full sustainable and that is i think where we see data as a utility um, like you have the wires for the electricity, like you have the streets to to make the cars upon. I think also the the, the, the data uh, platforms could be seen as um, an infrastructure where maybe governmental players need to take uh, responsibility. Uh, and also at the same time, they can step into the governance of these systems. So I think these things come, come together at least in, in, in our vertical, uh, yeah. that is my opinion. So uh, people, the audience will think that um, Jürgen and myself have um, uh, agreed upon uh, before, but not not really. Uh, we are a utility at ELE and we really believe that, uh, especially to kickstart, uh, to, to, to firestart a bit the, the data economy, um, there is a, a role to be played by uh, public actors, by the public sector um, to put some order in there uh, maybe with some standards having the, uh, some governance up but in the end if it's working without that that utility uh, in or central actor um, and, and standards are there rules are followed then that can disappear at one moment but setting up putting the investments in in the beginning that's something that can be done um, um, by, a, by a, a, a regulated actor yeah i i, I agree of course I also want to say that um, the, the investment is necessary, but what is also necessary is the win-win because uh, nobody cooperates as, unless there is a win for them. So what what uh, you were mentioning uh, about the governance is very important. So the more stakeholders um, are involved in this setting up or investment, the more ownership they feel uh, in this cooperation and uh, in, in the data sharing. And we see that in our projects, we see that in our platforms as well. Uh, from from my perspective uh, on, the, on the automotive platform, we see, I mean, as DT Tech, we see um, the need of cooperation with all the other uh, stakeholder, OEM, uh, suppliers, uh, tier one, um, and we are doing so, for example, specifically on uh, um, autonomous driving uh, for creating a reference architecture, because what we think is that no uh, partner, no uh, no one can do, uh, can tackle this challenge alone. And, and also, uh, but we see that uh, potentially the, the involvement of uh, um, the, of the government, of the European Commission, of public money, to support uh, this development because this is uh, we are talking about software uh, very intensive so it, we are talking about a huge investment so the fact that uh, a public uh, government or the commission put money on that uh, could also maybe steer uh, somehow a, the community especially the the european car manufacturer and the other player to cooperate more uh, on this topic Okay. Hey, Rolf, right. if, if I may add uh, yeah. my a last point on this question, because I, I like it. Um, so it is the, this uh, federated approach that needs the glue of the European institutions. Uh, so the investment coming from the European institutions is, is putting this basis for the uh, member states, the 27, uh, to, to, to harmonize. Um, and, and this is what we don't see in other regions. Uh, we, we came back from the ITS World Congress that we we held in LA last week, and we didn't see the departments of transport cooperating in the way that member states and departments of transport or communications and connectivity uh, cooperate in um, in Europe. And this is, I think, an achievement of the European Commission. Maybe a quick addition also to what you were saying, of course, and also 100% correct about this win-win. But um, for instance, the Flemish government uh, already gets a lot of data sharing requests. If they step into an infrastructure, they are also saving on the cost sites, actually, because now uh, all this management of government to business data sharing has to be managed by them, uh, mostly one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. 
um, actually also for them it's cheaper to to use a common infrastructure i mean the costs of the data sharing are, are fully shared by all the players on uh, on the platform so th there's a cost benefit there's a clear cost uh, benefit there yeah okay thank you are there any questions for any questions from the audience if not we try to wrap up i think it's not not the case i think we are a bit uh, eight minutes late so thanks again for our panelists for the discussion for answering our questions um, we have heard that um, to make it happen, yes, we have to work on the APIs and on the structure. Uh, it's a great, it's a big thing, particularly in mobility data spaces as well, um, and it's um, in the, the energy data space. So these are still in an embryonic phase. Uh, while we have seen in the second panel, you know, if you move to operations and really decision making, uh, the real stuff uh, which covers the the safety of uh, of mobility or food safety. We are a bit more advanced on the operational platforms. There's something happening. We see the challenge of the change of the, the supply chains, which have to here sort of a, a common reference architecture or a common platform model. Uh, we have seen the advancement already in the farming sector, um, where we talk about contractual arrangements, um, where we see the, the, the openness of the platform uh, and the, the common baseline uh, on a, a code of conduct uh, to have uh, trust and respect uh, across the different stakeholders to make that happen. And still, at the end, we discussed, you know, what is the role of the public stakeholders. We, we've seen, in particular, in uh, with the regional dimension of farming, there's a strong need to support these sort of uh, regional embryonic uh, operational platforms. Uh, while on the other side, in more regulated markets, we see there's a need to to, to set the standards, um, the, the rule of cooperation. Uh, and to work on the governance um, across different stakeholders. Uh, to close, you know, there's the potential for platforms to grow, particularly in Europe, if we manage to have sort of a reduced fragmentation and coordinate on Oxford with the member states. Um, but still, um, industry stakeholders are in the, the driving seat. Uh, and I wish to close because we have the poll. We have seen 63% of people using a home standard app, which is nice. But we've seen, you know, there so still takes time, you know, until the other uh, platform here today, you know, make it to the consumer and they have a, they are controlled and they have an app. And still the home thermostat is most likely not able for the time being to coordinate with the solar panel and to for the heating of the boiler. So there's still some work to do and uh, and there's still some things happening. And we are in the middle of sort of a change in transition period, also caused by the crisis. And we all hope to, to get that things right in the collaborative approach and to put our stakes together. With that, you know, I wish to close. Thanks again for the panelists giving a clapping hand from our side. Thanks for all the uh, audience, uh, quite large in numbers, more than 100, I heard, um, joining us for that one for this afternoon. Wish you a good rest of the day and please stay tuned. Thank you again. <laughs>